all right, I'm not jealous of many people on earth, but I think I'm jealous of Craig Clements because not only has he built a successful billion dollar company with no outside investors, but he has made hit after hit after hit. And I asked him to come on the podcast and he thought it was just going to be a normal episode. But then when we started talking, I realized that I wanted him to give me a masterclass. And when he's given it to me, he's given it to you, which is to teach us the seven ways that he, he, as a marketer, has sold over a billion dollars of products online. He calls these the seven human hijacks. And he goes through example after example of how great products and things that we take for granted, like brushing your teeth or how people eat bacon for breakfast. Those weren't things people did back in the day. It was guys like him, marketers, that use specific tactics in order to make those a thing. And if you're an entrepreneur who uh, you know, wants to be successful, you need to be good at marketing. You got to be able to sell your product. And it's very rare to be able to sit with somebody like Craig, who's actually one of the best to ever do it, and ask him, how did you do it? I, I, mean, I feel lucky he's doing this. He doesn't have to tell us these secrets. Like, you know, I think he's at that sweet spot where he's been running his company for 15 years. He's been doing this for a long time. He's, you know, the company's super successful. I don't feel like he has to like guard those secrets anymore. So I told him to give them to us. <laughs> and I don't know about you, but I've had professors in school. I've took marketing classes, but those were not people who have actually been in the game done it. People have actually created categories, sold hundreds of millions of dollars of single products that a year ago, nobody had ever heard of. And so Craig tells the story of how others did it. And at the end, he tells a story about how he helped create the probiotics category. If you ever had probiotics, you can thank Craig because he was the one who created uh, that category and made it mainstream. So enjoy this marketing masterclass on the seven human hijacks, how marketers have hijacked your brain with Craig Clements. What's up, dude? You, uh, I have this theory now of guests who come on the podcast. The more their video setup looks like they were either taken hostage or are like, you know, in some motel somewhere, uh, the better the guest is. And we had Balaji on and he was like, white wall, nothing in the room. And he was just like, you know, at the time he didn't have his like video set up. Like, you know, he was not in his home video setup. And like the higher your IQ, the worse your video setup. And the opposite is true, unfortunately, for me, which is the more HD and beautiful your video setup, the less interesting things you usually have to say. Yes, yes. And the cool thing is you're like the real life bad man. You, you, you're an ad guy and a copywriter who translated those skills into a billion dollars of sales, which is why when you were coming on this time, we started talking and we kind of realized that you have a masterclass in you. So normally we hang out, we just shoot the shit about business ideas, but occasionally we just drop a knowledge bomb and the knowledge bomb is what we call a masterclass, which is just let somebody do their thing for 30 minutes. And the cool thing about this is you said you had given a talk internally to your team, to your company to pump them up. And it sounded so dope that I just said, can you just please do that on the pod? And you, you agreed. And so my friend, the floor is going to be yours. I'm here when you need me. I might chime in here and there, but I'm really going to let you cook during this and uh, let Craig Clemens do this masterclass. So take it away. So, Sean, did you brush your teeth this morning? Did you take an elevator or are you wearing sneaks right now? Any, any one of, yeses? One of three ain't bad. One of three ain't bad. <laughs> one of three ain't bad. Okay, well, marketers created all of that. Marketers created so much of our daily behavior that uh, people that I tell these stories to don't even want to accept it. And, you know, it's it's okay, though. I mean, that's... that's uh, that's the case for everyone. You're not alone. So do you know who this guy is on the left here? I do not, but he looks very sophisticated. Who is that? This is a, this is a smart motherfucker. This is Sigmund Freud. <laughs> oh. And this gentleman on the right, do you know who that is? I'm guessing you don't. I do not. Okay. Well, this guy has changed your life. This guy is a man named Edward Bernays. He's often called the father of public relations. And he is actually Sigmund Freud's nephew. So uh, I don't know uh, what exactly kind of kind of shirt you're wearing over there, Sean, or if you uh, put some some style into it. But this guy is, has his, his hands in so much stuff that he, he literally created consumerism. So quick example... Before Bernays, people would buy clothes uh, as you know, unless you were in like the the upper classes, people would buy clothes to go to work. Um, he's he, the one who got together with a bunch of other people, and they were like, "Wait a second, these work clothes, people aren't buying enough of them. If people use clothing for expression, 
then people would buy more clothes. And he got the expression uh, vibe to go all the way down the line from anyone who could afford clothing to be buying more clothing and then buying more things when they came into season and this and that. Now it's people who don't have the means that buy buy, buy more clothing they can, they can afford, right? <laughs> well, let me just get into some of the, the examples here and then you'll see that this guy was operating on a level that uh, is, is unfathomable. So in this presentation, I'm going to share with you what I've discovered studying and creating marketing campaigns that have caused world change. And I call them the seven human hijacks because when you use these seven things, you are hijacking the limbic system of the brain and a, a human cannot help themselves but to pay attention and either respond or at least log what you're going to do or say into their brain and maybe they respond the next time. But these seven hijacks, I'm going to share each of them after I share these marketing campaigns that you're going to see how they repeat. And not every campaign uses all seven, but um, you'll see that some of them are extremely powerful. And then when you put them all together, that's when you can really do this type of thing yourself. So if you're watching this right now and you're excited about you possibly changing the world forever, this is the recipe. Let's go. Our software is the worst. Have you heard of HubSpot? See, most CRMs are a cobbled together mess, but HubSpot is easy to adopt and actually looks gorgeous. I think I love our new CRM. Our software is the best. HubSpot, grow better. Okay, one of the most interesting marketing campaigns of all time was created by a guy named Claude Hopkins. So Claude Hopkins was approached by a toothpaste company called Pepsodent. And they said, Claude, we want to sell more of our toothpaste. And he looked at the lay of the land and he realized there was a problem. He said to Pepsodent, he said, look, only 5% of people brush their teeth on a daily basis. So why are you even in this business that not a lot of uh, people are taking part? Can you believe that, Sean? 1920s. 95% of the women that you kiss are going to have terrible breath. No one brushed their teeth back then. And so Claude tells the, the founders of Pepsi and he's like, look, if you guys really want to sell some toothpaste, you're going to have to get people brushing their teeth. And so he created this masterful ad campaign that built Pepsi into the, the dominating toothpaste brand for, for decades. And this is the ad. The ad says the film that discolors the whitest teeth. And then he has you do a demonstration. So do this with me, Sean. Take the tip of your yep. tongue, put it over the the, the fronts, like put front it over these gold fronts you got under there. Mm -hmm. Okay, do you feel that film there on your teeth? Yeah, I kind of do. Kinda okay, do. so the ad goes on to say that brushing with Pepsodent is going to remove that film. And behind that film is a movie star smile. <laughs> and it's so genius, right? Because everybody wants that movie star smile. Everybody has that film, whether you just brushed your teeth five minutes ago or not. Then you feel that and you're like, oh, shoot, I got this film, you know? And then it talks about how Pepsi did is the way to get rid of that film. So the result of this ad, within a decade, 85% of Americans then brush their teeth on a daily basis. And Pepsi did is still around today. Um, they ran this ad campaign for, I don't know, 50 years, something like that. Um, and I'll tell you something interesting is about 10 years in, there was other companies trying to compete with Pepsodent and they were using a similar ad campaign. You know, it's very common to steal an ad campaign, but they couldn't get the repeat orders. And they did a, a focus group and they found out that people love Pepsodent because it had this like minty flavor that made their mouth tingle after they brushed with it. And right. then the toothpaste companies, the other ones started knocking that off. And when people felt the tingle, then they would stick with the other companies. Otherwise they'd try the other one. They would feel, wouldn't feel the tingle and they'd be like, oh, it's not actually working, you know? So they'd go right back to Pepsi. Then. So they, they owned it for like 10 years and then it got actually competitive because then people were not only stealing their ads, they were stealing, uh, you know, their, their secret of the tingle. So what are the, <laughs> the human hijacks that Claude Hopkins used? One, he sold the dream of the movie star smile. And you're going to see this theme reoccurring throughout this presentation. Uh, second, he 
created a powerful demonstration that anyone could do. And that's just rubbing your tongue over the, the front of your teeth. And then the next thing he did is he made it about them. He made it about the potential user. And this is a, a big thing that uh, a lot of companies mess up is they just talk about their own product and you know why they're so excited about it, but they don't talk about why it's going to be exciting for the user. And Claude did a really great job of that sharing how it's going to give them that movie star smile. So, so that's, that's like the, there's this diagram that I love. That's like, um, the, I call it the Mario marketing. I, I don't know who originally created this. I saw it from that company buffer, but I don't, I don't know if they created it originally, but it's little Mario, um, you know, Mario when he's small, then it's the fire flower. And then when Mario gets the fire flower, he's able to shoot fireballs out of, you know, out of his hands. He's running around. He's huge. He, he can shoot fireballs. And basically it says, uh, don't sell this, the fire flower, which is your product, sell this, which is the customer going from little Mario to being big Mario who can shoot fireballs, uh, right? And it's like, that's what you want to sell is th how the user will be more badass rather than all the features and uh, facets about your product. Yes, exactly. So think about benefits. What's the benefit? What's in it for them? You know, these people are busy. Right now, Sean, I think people see something like 4,000 ads a day. And... They did a study and it showed that the human brain has the um, uh, same intelligence span as a goldfish. It's like less than, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, the ability of a goldfish to pay attention. So how do you grab their attention? Well, you have to talk about something that's exciting to them, something that keeps them up at night or something that they, you know, have a deep dream, hope and desire for. So I want to get back to that demonstration. Though. Where did Claude get the idea for this demonstration? So 1854, there's a guy named Otis and Otis gets into the elevator business and he didn't invent the elevator, but he came up with a, a, a braking system for the elevator. So back then people were afraid to use elevators because every once in a while, just like today you hear about a car accident, you'd hear about an elevator accident where you know people get on and the elevator falls down, right? So Otis creates this great braking system. First year out, he only sells three elevators. The next year out, he sells seven elevators. Like no one cares, you know? He doesn't, doesn't uh, have the ability to get the word out. And then he meets this guy named P.T. Barnum. And so everyone probably now knows uh, P.T. Barnum, one of the, the greatest uh, marketing and showmen of all time. And P.T. Barnum says, this is what we're going to do. We're going to go to the Crystal Palace in New York City, which was this big exhibition hall, and we're going to do a grand demonstration. So Otis gets up there on this elevator shaft, and he has his assistant get up there with an axe. And so he's standing on it. The, the elevator goes up the shaft just like it normally would in a building. And he's like, cut the cord, Jimmy. He goes, boom. <laughs> and he cuts the first cord. The elevator drops like just a little bit. And then there's one more cord hanging and everyone's looking out. And they're like, oh, shit, what's he going to do? You know, it's, this is the cord. And then, boom, it puts actually the second cord. And the elevator, it's only two feet and stops. And he's like, all safe here, gentlemen, all safe. Uh, and those are like like famous words that were published in the newspaper, all safe <laughs> here. And it showed that Otis had invented a braking system for elevators that worked. So over the next decade, he sold 2,000 elevators. He got all the greatest commissions. He did the, the Eiffel Tower, the Empire State Building. And even today, if you look at your elevator, I found about half of the elevators I get into have this little Otis logo. Yeah, that totally. Otis is, is still all, crushing all elevator. my zippers. All my zippers say YKK, and all my elevators say Otis. That's all. Those are the only two things I know. Yeah. So, uh, so that's the power of a great demonstration. So, what did what did Otis do? The the powerful demonstration stands in people's minds, and he also made it an event. You know. So, what's great about an event? Well, one, people are going to show up, and two, it's going to get covered by the newspaper. But if you think about it on a, on a more primal level, have you ever heard the phrase, Sean, nothing attracts a crowd like a crowd? <laughs> no, but I like that. One of my favorite favorite sayings, and it, it just shows that humans cannot resist an event. You know, If you're walking down the street and then you see like a big crowd of people and something's going on over there and there's a band or whatever, it's like, you got to see what, what's going on. It's just, just natural. 
And so if you make your advertising an event, then people cannot not pay attention to it. And then he also showed unquestionable proof using that demonstration and putting his own body on an elevator. He didn't use a dummy. He didn't use a monkey. Himself was on that elevator while his assistant was, was cutting the cords. And so that's the type of unquestionable proof that lead people to go ahead and take, take a, uh, action to buy without questioning it. And of course he made right. it about them. He didn't get up there and show his fancy braking system or how it worked. You know, he addressed the fear in everyone's mind that was about the safety of, of getting on an elevator and he did it with the powerful demonstration. So oh, let me show you, uh, let me show you something. Hold on. All right. Do you know this brand, Mini Katana? Have you seen them, Craig? I have not. All right. So I am about to, uh, YouTube, don't be alarmed. This is, inside here is a giant sword. And um, this company, so this brand, they sell these, it's called Mini Katana, but it's actually humongous. So they sell these swords. Now, the problem with selling swords is that Google and Facebook don't let you do it. <laughs> you can't advertise weapons. So how does an e-commerce brand work when you can't advertise weapons? Well, what they did was they started, they hired like 20 YouTubers and TikTokers and they would have them do what you just described, the powerful demonstration. So they would take this, they would take this sword and they would, instead of saying, you know, why you need a sword, because most people don't need a sword, let's be honest. Uh, instead of talking about how long it is or how sharp it is or whatever, they would show that the sword could cut through a bullet that was fired at them. So this wow. video starts with a guy's holding the sword and there's a bullet aimed at him and he's going to try to split it in half. And, uh, and then when he does it, it's a powerful presentation about like how badass these swords are. And he, they all of their marketing, they'll take a stake, though you just see a stake plop down on a cutting board and then a giant sword cutting through it, which is completely unnecessary, but it is a powerful demonstration. Um, and, you know, I, I remember seeing those TED Talks where guys take a glass and they, you know, it's like, here's dirty water. Would you drink this water? It's like, no way. And then they put it into their filter and they, like with their bottle filter and then they start to drink it. I don't know who this was, Bill Gates or something. Yeah. And, and sometimes chugs they throw in the water first, right? For, for real. Yeah, exactly. Things. They make it yeah. disgusting and then the whole crowd is gasping and yeah. like, they could tell you how the filter works. Or they could show you that they're willing to drink the water through this filter that was like disgusting water. And I still remember that was like 20 years ago. I still remember that video because it's just high. You're right. It hijacked my brain. Yeah. The, the knife companies are genius. Any knife infomercial will do this where they'll be taking a knife and cutting a penny, you know, or like <laughs> effortlessly slicing tomatoes through the air. And you know who was uh, the king of this was Dr. Oz. Dr. Oz. What did he do? Every episode of the dr oz show is a marketing masterclass. he advertised <laughs> oh shit these, i'm sleeping on dr oz yeah he advertised these nutrients and i don't know if he had some type of deal with manufacturers or something like that but he would advertise like um like resveratrol or like um garcinia cambogia berries which were like weight loss but he wouldn't ever advertise a specific brand he would just talk about garcinia cambogia if you look one of the reasons it's hard to advertise supplements online is because Dr. Oz would go and talk about Garcinia Cambogia or whatever berry. <laughs> and then all these scammers would create websites uh, <laughs> selling Garcinia Cambogia on auto ship that you could never get out. Of. You know, you'd sign up on the website, <laughs> the company would disappear, but that thing would be d docking your credit card for years later, you know, no <laughs> uh, whatever. So Dr. Oz, one of the ones I remember is he'd go on there and he'd say, this is your body and these balloons on it. And then you'd have a, like a mannequin with, with balloons on it. These balloons are the fat cells. Oh, wow. Garcinia Cambogia is a miracle berry that works for any body type. And then he'd take out a pin. He'd be like, this is the <laughs> berry. Pop, 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 pop. That's what Garcinia Cambogia does to the fat cells in your body. <laughs> and he just made a craze, man. Like a billion dollars of Garcinia Cambogia we stole over the next few months, mostly to these scammy auto billing marketers. It was it was wild. Right. And he did this with like five 
different berries over time. And eventually he got pulled into Congress to testify and all this shit. And like, no it way. Was wild. You know, he rolled with it because he was getting all these allegations that he was starting on one episode. He goes, uh, he gets a camera crew behind him and he goes down to one of the companies that's selling the Garcinia Cambogia and he knocks on the door and he's got the camera behind him. The founder comes out. He's like, <laughs> hey, I didn't give you permission to use my name and likeness to sell your Garcinia Cambogia. And like your auto billing customers and this <laughs> and that, you know, and he was like pretending that he was the the good guy, but I don't know, man. I don't know if like Garcinia <laughs> was lining his pockets or something before it happened. But like, did this with so many berries and for so many years, uh, it, it it's crazy, man. It was like billions That's of dollars of fraud happened because it because of his show. You know, you know what I love about this is um, a lot of the audience who listens to this, and a lot of the people I know who are uh, entrepreneurial or technical type engineering type people often so um, rational and logical and like sort of analytical about the way that they want to, about the way they see the world. And so the idea that, hey, we're going to do this event with the the axe swinging at the the, the rope or, you know, we're going to blow up these balloons and the, they'll be like, well, that's not what the fat cell looks like. That's way too big. That's not to scale. Um, you know, like you have to almost, you have to use the other part of your brain if you're going to do this. You have to make something powerful, visual, dramatic. And those are not skills that typically your kind of um, operational or technical person is used to flexing. And so what I love about this is these examples that give you inspiration to be able to like, go use that other part of your brain. You know, if you look at these, we got the hijacks up here, right? From Otis Elevator. All of these apply to what I just said about Dog Draws. The event is that it's a TV show, you know, so that makes an event already. The demonstration the unquestionable proof is him. He's a doctor saying that this is going to work for you. And then making it about them. He says, this is the miracle weight loss cure for all body types. Like oh, those are almost his exact words. <laughs> and by the way, you, you know who else does this amazingly well? Elon. Elon, who's the, you know, the scientist, the hardcore engineer. You know what he's brilliant at? Just yesterday, the news was, um, there's the, they're getting, they're hyping Cybertruck right now. And you, you, do you, did you see that news that came out, which was, that they unloaded a full magazine of some assault rifle at the door. And so there's a bunch of holes in the door. Like that you could see where the bullet hit the door, but didn't go through. And so he's driving that car around and leaked that kind of the tweet rumor that, Hey, they tested it this way. And he did this at their onstage event too, but it, it fucked up. Like he tried to take a sledgehammer and show how indestructible this was. He swung the sledgehammer and then they like broke through the window and he's like, Oh shit, that wasn't supposed to happen. Like this is supposed to be bulletproof. But, um, he was trying to do that. He was trying to, you know, PT Barnum, uh, you know, their cyber truck, which is, which is really, really cool to see. Yeah. You know, what was another incredible success that I think was complete bullshit was the, the power balance bracelet. Do you remember those? It was like, dude, I was thinking about that when you did the, the tongue on the teeth, that's the first thing I thought yeah. of where yeah. people used to say, Hey, hold out your arms. Yeah. And now watch how easy I go on one foot, watch how easily I could tip you over. Right. <laughs> and then you put this bracelet trick, on man. and now it's just a now you can't be angle of which way you press on the arm yeah <laughs> totally I totally chiropractor recently and he was doing that with me and i was like uh -oh. oh god am i getting <laughs> seen by this this chiropractor but uh yeah i think power balance actually got popped uh for that as they right. they deserved um but yeah. that was that was a, a very effective technique even though it was uh, you know unethical in that case yeah Okay, let's get into some. Uh, so those are those are, last two are, are for good, right? We want people to brush their teeth. We want right. elevators to be safe. Uh, now let's talk about some evil campaigns. All right, <laughs> so okay, 1930s, all the the men had come back from the war, you know, and they gave them free cigarettes. So like, so many men were hooked on smoking that there was no room for growth. So the cigarette companies come to Eddie Bernays, uh, Lucky Strike in particular is who, who came to him and they're like, hey, we need more customers. He's like, well, you already got all the men. But at that time, Sean, it was illegal for a woman to smoke in public. It was literally fucking illegal. <laughs> and there was like cafes in New York City where, the, you know, there's there's stories of, of like high society women getting asked to leave. And then women that could afford it would have like special smoking rooms in their homes that would, you know, that, that really liked it because they weren't allowed to do it in public. Oh, and I should add something too. Women didn't really want to smoke uh, mo for the most part. You know, they, they weren't really pushing back against it. Yes, it was illegal, but it was also considered unladylike. It was a, it was a man thing, you know? So 
he says to Lucky Strike, he's like, look, you know, you got to you got to get the women smoking. So what was going on at the time was the women's rights movement. You know, so women were out in the streets marching about, you know, wanting the right to vote. And, and Bernays capitalized on that. So the big social event of the day, kind of like the Oscars of today, was the Easter parade, which would go down Fifth Avenue and all the reporters would be standing on the sidelines. And so Bernays organized a float and he called up all of the, the socialites and debutantes, like the Paris Hiltons and Kim Kardashians of the day. <laughs> and he got them all to go on this float and they're cruising down Fifth Avenue, the parade's happening, you know, when they get to the corner where all the reporters were, the women do you, uh, go into their stocking, they pull out cigarettes put them in their mouths and light them up. So imagine, you know, <laughs> Paris and uh, Chloe and all the Kardashians and even all the Jenners on one float, they all just start blazing <laughs> up, right? And the reporter's <laughs> like, what is going on here? This is this is obscene, you know, women aren't supposed to do this. Bernays and his crew went around to the reporters and they said, oh, no, no, no. They're not smoking. They are declaring their rights with these torches of freedom. Oh, wow. And so the, the, <laughs> the newspapers ran with that. They're like, you know, uh, women uh, present torches of freedom to show that they are equal with men and they can smoke too. And so turned it into a movement. And if you think about smoking to this day, if you think about a, women, uh, a woman who smokes, um, I think I'm a bit older than you, Sean, but I think of like, Kate Moss and like the, you know, sexy model yep. smoking. Now it might be considered gross for a woman to smoke again, <laughs> you know, or anyone to smoke. I don't really know what the kids these days are thinking, but yeah, we, you know, you think of like some like badass, badass woman. And you remember that old movies with Audrey Hepburn, you know, that famous scene, I think it's a uh, breakfast at yep. Tiffany's where she's puffing that long cigarette, you know? So yeah, completely changed the world there. That's amazing. I had never heard that story, um, uh, but I love that. Th that's like a combination of you got the event, you have uh, kind of newsjacking, which was jumping on uh, to an existing trend, but then also um, the the co just the copywriting of the the words there of you know these aren't cigarettes, these are torches of freedom. That's really really powerful. Yeah, the plants. If you like that plant strategy, Ryan Holiday wrote a great book called Trust Me, I'm Lying, and he talks about all these phrases that he planted in the, the heads of these reporters when he was promoting things like uh tucker max books and and you know wild stuff back then so there's a new lesson in here a uh, new hijack so to speak and that is help them rebel or mm. feel superior so people have this tendency in them they want to go against the grain they want to show that they are not one of the sheep you know they want to show that they are not going to bow down to the, the mainstream pressure or society standards, things like that, you know? And this is a really powerful concept that you're going to see appear throughout uh, some of the, the other demonstrations here. But that's, that's what Bernays allowed them to do is, is to rebel and, and maybe even feel superior to the rest because they're, they're leading the charge. Right. Okay, keep going. I'm, by the way, I'm loving this. So keep going. All right, so Bernays had a problem. Lucky Strike uh, did this big campaign to get women to start smoking, and they did start smoking, but they didn't smoke Lucky Strikes. Because <laughs> if you remember, boop, 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 see the Lucky Strike package there, Sean? What color is the main color? It's green. Well, green was a very undesirable color back in those days. It was considered an ugly color. And so Bernays got all these women smoking, but Lucky's like, what the fuck, Bernays? They're not smoking Lucky Strikes. So he has to come up with something new. So he goes back to his, his debutantes and, and socialites, and as they say here, women of prominence, and they create the first ever gala green ball at the Waldorf Hotel in New York City. And the magazines started following around the Kardashians of the day to see what type of outfits they were going to wear that were styled in green and Women started bringing green decor into their homes and it just became a, a big thing. And the gala happens and the women are photographed in their exotic green outfits. And it, it became the most fashionable color within one year. 
going from the, <laughs> the, the ugliest color to the most fashionable color. And Lucky Strike, without even trying, became the number one selling uh, brand of cigarettes for women because they subconsciously wanted that green box. Holy shit. Wow. Is one of the hijacks, by the way, using people of prominence or you didn't, you don't include that in the, in the hijacks? Unquestionable proof. That mm. falls under unquestionable proof. It's a great question. But yes, when we humans see someone, uh, as they just said in the New York Times article, someone of prominence doing something, we automatically assume it's been vetted. We automatically assume it's okay. And we automatically have something in us that makes us want to do that. Maybe it's from when we were all in tribes and, you know, if a chief is doing something, then you do it too. Who knows? But that's, that's unquestionable proof, you know? And so, uh, you know, he made an event where this unquestionable proof happened. And also there was this force that, that they wanted to rebel against, you know, these celebrities are like, oh, I'm cool enough where I can wear green and it'll look good, you know? You know, I heard this other other thing, Sean, today. So uh, how old are you? Are you public with your age? Yeah, yeah, I'm 35. 35, okay, I'm 44. So when you think of emojis, what do you think about? When I think of emojis? Yeah, like who do you think uses emojis? I would have said like teenagers, teens and tweens. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think, but then I see people in India, and like my auntie, my aunts, and, and and my aunts are crazy about about emojis. Yes, I would have thought the same. So my my buddy is a, a dad of two teenagers. He said they will not use emojis because they think emojis are something adults use. <laughs> they do not want to be associated with the adults. So kids these days they don't use emojis. They'll just use like different text characters. And things like that. So you've probably seen these little like one to two or sorry, two to three character terms that they use like TBH or like, you know, it stands for to be honest or FR, which right. means like for real, you know, they use those type of things to separate themselves from the adults. You know, people want to push right. back. It's a, it's a natural human instinct. Yeah. When, um, when Snapchat came out, it was getting really popular. One of the things that, uh, I remember in Silicon Valley, all the like product genius blogger guys were like. Yeah, it's you know what the, what Snapchat should do is make it easier to use because look at this like uh, at the time like you know to use those face filters you had to like there was no button on the screen you had to just hold down on your face for three seconds like a magic trick uh, like a, like a secret door that you didn't know that nobody else knew about um, or even just in signing up there was like all these like funky ways to do it and um, and then the people I think one of the guys at Snapchat came out was like look it's intentional we want you know you know you baby proof medicine. We're, we're boomer proofing this app. Like the way that this is going to become really popular amongst young people is that we don't make it easy for older people to get in and figure out how this whole thing works. And we want to make it easy for one friend to tell another the secret on how to do something so that they feel like they're in on it with, with them. And it's like a word of mouth virality of how do you do that? Exactly. It's like, once your parents and your grandma got on Facebook, it wasn't cool anymore, you know? Right. And then everyone went to Instagram. And now, you know, Uncle Bob's on Instagram and it's just like losing, losing the hype, yeah. you know, so everyone goes over <laughs> to TikTok, right? And we'll see if something comes next. You know, I think the the moms are, well, moms are definitely a big group on TikTok now. Um, I don't know if like, I don't know, are you on TikTok? I'm I'm not. I, I have like a strong- Yeah, I got to admit. I love TikTok, even though, you know, it's my lucky strike. I know, I know I probably shouldn't be, be smoking that TikTok every night, but I do. Well, you know, TikTok is crack. It is digital crack. <laughs> Very well designed digital crack. So don't blame yourself. People say that, but like when I think when they say that, they mean avoid it. And I'm like, wait, cracks like isn't crack supposed to be like the greatest experience when people do it? And, I, and then I open up TikTok and I start swiping. Yeah. Well, you know, actually speaking of drugs, funny enough, there's another rebellion I'm seeing in in my community against alcohol right now. Mm. And and I remember in my twenties that it was all about the alcohol. You know, if you didn't show up uh, if you should have a party empty handed, you know, it's like not cool. I've gone to parties now with a bottle and they'd be like, oh, this is a non-alcoholic party. <laughs> Can you go put that back in your car? <laughs> it's like this little pushback, you know? Um, but I hope you brought some ketamine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. I'll, last campaign I'm going to share with you about uh, Eddie Bernays is the Great American Breakfast. So early in the, you know, 19th century, uh, 20th century breakfast was like some coffee and, and maybe a roll or some oatmeal or something like that. Right. No one actually had like a actual hearty 
breakfast. And Beech Nut Bacon comes to Bird and they're like, hey, we want to sell more bacon. He's like, well, people are eating bacon usually for dinner, sometimes for lunch. There's another meal here we can take advantage of. And so Bernays goes to uh, his his on staff doctor, or actually no, it was it was, uh, it was Beach that's on staff doctor, and he says, "Hey doc, would you agree that a hearty breakfast containing bacon would be the best way to start your day?" And the doctor is like, "Oh, of course I agree with you." Do you think some of your doctor friends would agree? So he has him write five thousand letters to doctors across the nation. <laughs> saying, hey, I think bacon is the healthiest breakfast and people should be eating a heartier breakfast. Do you agree? 4,500 doctors wrote back and they're like, yes, I agree. That makes perfect sense. They didn't turn this into an ad campaign, but what they did do is they shared that result with all of the newspapers. And so newspapers started publishing headlines. Doctors agree a hearty breakfast containing bacon is the best way to store energy to last throughout your workday. And but that's how people started eating eating bacon for breakfast. And, you know, all the all the bacon companies started going crazy because it became a breakfast thing. Wow. So what are we doing here? We're selling the dream, you know, of a, of a breakfast that's going to give you more energy to get throughout your day. You know, so that's making it about them as well. The unquestionable proof, 4,500 doctors can't be wrong, Right. And then there's even a little bit of uh, um, feeling superior here because if your buddy is over there eating a roll, you're like, hey, Sean, got something to tell you about that roll, man. It's not as hearty. <laughs> is this your bacon? Right. Yeah. So it taps into all these, these same psychological hijacks. You keep seeing them over and over. Okay, so let's take a step back now uh, a couple decades to the 1910s. Orange juice. Now, I grew up in the 80s and my mom had us drink orange juice every day for vitamin c was this a thing sean when when you were a kid uh, totally totally orange yeah. juice is uh, when i was a kid orange juice is good for you it's vitamin c which is you know good for your immunity this is what i was told and uh drank a lot of sugar because of that yeah so orange juice actually has the same amount of, of sugar as a coca-cola <laughs> so orange juice is, <laughs> yeah. you know it's it's glucose or something i don't know maybe it's a different kind of sugar but it ain't good for you so this was all the, the result of a, a marketing man named Albert Lasker, who was probably the, uh, the man responsible for more consumer change um, in the early 1900s than anyone. Claude Hopkins, Pepsin, Claude actually worked with Albert. He was his top copywriter. And prior to Claude coming on board, Albert was contacted by the California Growers Association. They're like, Al Albert, we got so many oranges here in California, we're going to cut down trees because they overproduce and then we need to get rid of them and it brings the bugs and all that stuff. You know, how can we sell more oranges? And he looked at the lay of land and all these orange growers were competing against each other, trying to say like, we have the best orange, we have the best orange or whatever. He goes, okay, first of all, you guys are all teaming up. And <laughs> so he teamed all up together and he put them under one brand name and he called it Sunkist, which I think is a, a pretty genius name. Yes. And then as he's, he's meeting with them, he, he notices that, what the, the growers would do for their kids as a, as a, as a special treat is they'd take that orange and they'd, they'd squeeze it into a cup and they'd give their kids little, little shots of the juice. It's like, ah, wait a second. How many oranges did it take to make that juice? And they're like, oh, you know, three or four or whatever. So he thought, what if we could make that mainstream? Because the juice tasted really good. And so he had a uh, engineer invent this device that you could you know, cheap plastic device that you can put an orange on. And then he created this campaign talking about how oranges have all these vitamins in them and, you know, will help you get more of your nutrients from food, tying orange juice to meals. So you think about, oh, well, I, I want to get the nutrients from this food, so I'm going to drink orange juice with it. And then he had this campaign where you buy a box of oranges and you send in your, your proof of purchase and they send you this juicer thing. So it was like you get something for free and created orange juice. And so what does he do? He's selling the dream of getting the more nutrients from your food. The uh, um, unquestionable proof, you know, if you, if you go to actually read that ad, there was like, you know, doctors recommend and, and things like that. Um, he made it about them because it's showing them that they can get some benefit here. And then here's a new hijack that's appearing for the first time. 
Um, actually, maybe, I mean, I guess it would apply to toothpaste, but uh, change daily behavior. If you can change someone's daily behavior, you can create something big. So two modern examples of this, Bulletproof Coffee. Are you familiar with Bulletproof Coffee? Uh, I'm just familiar with it from the surface level, but yeah, tell me, tell me. You about know what? It. Do you know what it is? Uh, it's like the butter coffee or the oil coffee, MCT oil yeah. coffee. Is yeah. that what it is? So you walk into any Starbucks in the country, they don't serve bulletproof coffee, but they know what it is. Everyone knows what it is, and the genius that that Dave Asprey had was he changed the behavior of these uh, of people that were already doing something. He kind of like. Like intercepted uh, their coffee. It's an additive to your coffee well, rather than a new new behavior. So so now he's he's changing the existing behavior. Yes, changing the existing behavior. And so there's a there's a book called The Miracle Morning, and it talk uh, talks about the power of journaling every day. So you buy this book called The Miracle Morning, and then you do this specific journal every day, right? Long after you read the book. And I met the author of that, Hal Elrod, and he told me something that that stuck with me, I thought was fascinating. He said, when was the last time you recommended a book? And I was like, well, I was just read this book on Genghis Khan. You know, I've been telling all my friends about it or whatever. He's like, when were you telling them about it? I was like, well, I was telling them about it when I was reading it. And he said, okay, well, most people recommend books during the, the time they're reading that book. And then they go and they read the next book. Right now I'm reading Elon's biography. It's great. That's why I just told you about that, Sean. I'm literally in the middle of it. You know, I can tell you what book I read last month or last year. People talk about the things they're doing now. So if you change their daily behavior, like Hal did with getting people to journal in the morning, they, they talk about it all the time. So that book has sold hundreds of thousands of copies or maybe even millions by now, because um, this is 10 years ago when he told me this, because people are doing this behavior every day. And so they're talking about it every day. They're like, oh, what'd you do today? Oh, I just did my morning mm -hmm. Uh, miracle journaling, like, oh, what's that? You know, so long after the book is through. So if you change b daily behavior, it has a, a, a viral effect that is uh, untouchable by anything else. Love that. Okay, so let's get to some more modern examples. The 1970s. Sean, do you know who this guy is? Um, no, some some runner. I don't know who it is. Okay, so this this guy's before our time, but a uh, gentleman's name Steve Prefontaine, mm. and Prefontaine was uh best comparison i can think of is like the, the michael phelps of his time you know no one was really thinking about swimming until michael phelps came around who was such a dominant athlete from the usa you know so everyone wanted to get behind him <laughs> so prefontaine was that guy for running and prefontaine had all these great quotes like muhammad ali ali he's like you know yeah someone can beat me but if you're gonna beat me you're gonna have to bleed you know and he's like, <laughs> nice. if, you don't, if you don't run until you until you feel like you're gonna you're gonna die, you're not honoring your gift, you know. So he had all these great quotes. He was a great media figure. He won every college record from like 500 meter up to 2,000 meter. Prefontaine was the man, and Nike was just coming up. They'd actually just started like making their going from being a distributor, making their own shoe. And fortunately, Prefontaine was in Oregon, so were they, and they got him to to wear their shoes and. It was a, a big thing because the unquestionable proof now, you've got Prefontaine, the top runner in the country, wearing Nike shoes. Um, tragically, Prefontaine passed in a car accident before he could go and, and honor his Olympic glory. But before he did that, he really put Nike on the map because you know running was his thing. Running, what's the one accessory that you need? Shoes. And so... This was such a big deal um, that it actually changed the entire industry. So, so prior to Prefontaine, Prefontaine was around in like the 70s, right? Um, if you read Phil Knight's book, he talks about if you went jogging in like the 40s, 50s, or 60s, people were like throwing bottles at you from your car because they're just like mad. They're like, what is this idiot <laughs> doing? You know, he's in the road or whatever. And it was just like really hated upon. And Prefontaine comes along and running actually becomes cool again. And so Nike got to ride that, that tailwind. And then what also happened is, is back then the people were wearing shoes that were like, uh, you know, kind of like the loafer or work shoe or, or whatever, like pretty basic shoes. And people wanted to rebel against that, rebel against the shoes that their dad was wearing. 
And so they started wearing these athletic shoes, these running shoes, as a part of their daily attire to make a statement that like, I'm rebelling and I'm superior. And it changed the entire shoe market. Now athletic shoes are probably the best selling shoe. And only a tiny percent of them are worn for athletic activities. And then it all started in the in the 70s with, with Prefontaine. And then of course, Nike had the amazing campaign with Jordan, which was more unquestionable proof, you know, making them feel superior because they got the best basketball shoe and sell the dream that they're going to be able to, to fly like Mike. So that was a, a world changing campaign that not a lot of people think about when they put on their kicks every morning, you know? You know, one of those that I feel like is happening right now in a small way. Um, so you remember like, I don't know, 10 years ago or something like that, those Vibram five finger shoes were like getting popular. Mm -hmm. Do you remember mm -hmm. those? Yeah. So like you would see one and you'd be like, what is this person wearing a foot glove? Like, what is this thing? And then they would immediately go into the spiel about why this is better for you and like how they do whatever. And I think this is like, I, I've seen this a lot now. There's a, there's a popular YouTuber or, or Instagram guy called Knees Over Toes Guy. And he's basically like, it's like a rebellion. He's like, have any of you ever been told when you're working out, like, don't let your knee go over your toe when you're squatting because it's bad form? He's like, bullshit. Like, um, I had all these knee surgeries. Nobody could tell me how to fix it. I fixed it myself because I started training that way specifically. So it's like a rebellion against the fitness industry. Then he's like, a rebellion against Nike because now Nike's the big bad, like, the incumbent. Mm -hmm. And so he's like, uh, Nike shoes, those are like wearing high heels. Um, you, you know, you shouldn't have uh, these like huge heeled shoes. You should have low drop uh, flat shoes, basically. And so he came out with his own shoe, but also there's just like a bunch of these brands now that are kind of like uh, flat, more like you're walking barefoot, uh, barefoot Whoop. shoes, like you're walking on, on the ground. And it's funny that like now Nike is the big kind of status quo that they want to rebel against and point out how, why why you shouldn't be wearing Nike shoes because of this other reason. Do 5,000 doctors agree that the Nike, uh, you know, cushion is actually bad for you. So, yeah. So, uh, you know, big one was uh, MacBook launched this ad that was called 1984 and it aired during the Super Bowl. And it, it uh, was a big rebellion against IBM. Everyone was using these IBMs and MacBook came out and they're like, we're the new thing, you know? And I think right. they got the idea from this Volkswagen ad right here. So Volkswagen, when they came out, I think it was uh, in the 60s, all those cars were huge. You know, if you think of like the 67 uh, Chevys, you know, these huge cars that you couldn't get into a parking spot and had all this extra stuff on them that you didn't need. They came out with this Think Small campaign that absolutely crushed it. And it was like the, the hipster statement at the time was to, to drive a, a VW Bug you know, and made one mm. of the best-selling cars. Um, there's another ad that just came out from someone who's a master of this, and that's Trump. So this is another video that, that I would suggest you play if you can, because it's really fascinating. And they show Hillary talking about how the Trump people ha have to be deprogrammed. Have you seen this ad? It just came out like two days ago. No, I haven't seen it. So what, what is it? With Trump taking a commanding lead, and Bidenomics hurting American families. Genius Hillary Clinton has come up with a way for Biden to win. There needs to be a formal deprogramming of the cult members. Formal deprogramming of the cult members. Deprogramming de de of, de of the cult members. A brilliant plan. And here's what that would look like. Pay attention. Pay attention. Joe Biden will defeat him. Defeat him. Defeat him. Defeat him. Biden has done an amazing job. Amazing, amazing job. But there's one small problem. The basket of deplorables. 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 Working Americans aren't idiots. And they know who's on their side. To American workers watching their take-home pay shrink and watching inflation destroy their family and their lives. To all of you, I have your back. I'm Donald J. Trump, and I approve this message. Wow. That's so well done. Well, I mean, love him or hate him, the, the man is a master marketer, and he just rallies his base to, to rebel against, uh, you know, the... the in um, incumbents, what's the word? The 
what yeah, is the it elites, called? the kind of the, small, the, the, the status quo. Yes, yeah. yeah. Do you think, uh, like in this case, do you think Trump has input on any of that, or this is just they hire some ad agency that does these things? Like, is he the master marketer, or he is he hiring both. master I marketers? Mean, <laughs> I mean, he 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 makes the sound bites. You know, that right. sound bite I think was live from a speech that they plugged. That at least right. it looks like it was. And, you know, a lot of times these speechwriters, they think about that. So there's a famous uh, um, speech Obama did, Yes, We Can. Do you remember that speech? Yep, yep. Of course. That was a huge one. So when, the, when the speechwriter first presented Obama with Yes, We Can, Obama didn't like it. He didn't want to give that speech. He thought it was too basic. He's like, I don't want to repeat the same thing over and over. You know, the, the audience deserves something more intelligent. And they had to convince him to, to do this yes we can <laughs> speech and present it as a rally cry. And, and finally he's like, okay, fine. You know, goes out and gives a speech. <laughs> and that sound bite, man. I think it was uh, uh Will I Am turned that into that music video that went crazy, you know? Right. It, it's just uh a, a really powerful sound bite. And and I find that the best politicians end up speaking in sound bites. Yeah, you know, which Reagan is what makes did it. Trump so effective at what he's doing. The yeah. blogger Scott Adams, if anybody wants to get a go deeper on this, the blogger Scott Adams who created Dilbert, he, when Trump was running in 2016 and nobody thought he would win, Scott Adams was one of the first people I saw that came out and was like, oh, not only can he win, he will win in a landslide, which is what exactly, which is what happened. And he explained, he goes, Trump has verbal kill shots. Um, you know, he yeah. has these phrases about. that he'll say about opponents where he'll be like, um, low energy Jeb Bush. And then you can never look at Jeb again and see anything but low energy. And Jeb's so offended by it that he feeds energy into that. Uh, like, you know, he starts to be flustered by it and then he starts to try to up his energy and then Trump will pat him on the head and be like, well, at least you're trying now, Jeb. Yeah, that's good. You're trying to pick up your energy. I like that. And he would just destroy candidates with like, you know, crooked Hillary. Um, you know, and he would just just brand people in a one shot kill with with, a, with these phrases and even the one you, that video you just showed, the kind of, I have your back, like, you know, he, he's very, very good at just repeating simple messages and, and branding himself one way and, and positioning himself against the others the other way. All right. So the eighties, here's a, a force for good. So did you know, uh, Sean, the phrase, uh, have one for the road, do you know where that came from? <laughs> <laughs> no, but now that I think about it, it's kind of a fucked up phrase, huh? So I would think that the the worst use of that phrase would be go and have one and then go drive it. It actually meant take a beer in your car and right. drink it <laughs> while you're driving away from uh, wherever you're going, right? So drunk driving was out of control and a can uh, uh, campaign was created, friends don't let friends drive drunk. And it had three things to do. Drive your friend home, have your friend sleep over, or call a cab, you know. And this cut drunk driving in half. It it, it was wow. something like a 40 to 50% uh, drunk driving decrease when this started going around. That's like, uh, Craig, if I say the phrase, this is your brain on drugs, what do you think of? Yeah, you think of that fried egg, a powerful demonstration, an, right? An, an egg hitting a frying pan, sizzling. Like, yeah, that was how long ago? That was like, it had to have been, I was a kid. Like I was, that was 20 plus years ago. And it still has hijacked my brain where if I, if I see an egg, I think about drugs or if I hear this is your brain on drugs, I hear the egg, right? Like, uh, that, that is so powerful how that worked. These powerful demonstrations are unforgettable. You'll never look at a sword and not think about the sword slicing through the bullet. Yeah. There's something about it that it really sticks in, in the human mind. Maybe it's a way we are taught how to learn, you know? Uh, I have a, I have a daughter now and she's learning physics, not the way I think of physics. And it's not something I thought, but you know, you have kids too. You see how they learn the way blocks fit together and gravity and all of this, you know, it teaches you a lot about how the human brain learns. And if you think about what these demonstrations are, they're, they're really physics demonstrations. So it's like, that's how we've been mm. learning since age zero, you know? And, it, and right, we right. need that foundational physics to survive. And you really notice it in babies. Like they need to know that it, if they're crawling and there's something here, that it's going to hurt if they hit it. Like it's so basic, but the kids don't know that they actually have to learn that. 
you know? And you think about, I, I was always like, why don't we remember anything before we're five years old? And I think it's because the brain is optimizing to learn physics. I think the <laughs> physics are just so important that you just like- right. We don't, don't need memory right now. <laughs> the physics are like the fundamentals, man. If you don't know physics, you're gonna fucking die. <laughs> like just you know walking down the street right right so it's all physics you know i think these are like new physics lessons that that we find really fascinating um you know That's what else cool. people are really interested in is these uh they call them asmr videos oh where 100%. it's like, the, like dude, soothing things that are happening we did this as an ad for my e-com brand so i was watching tiktoks and there's these tiktoks that are these soothing asmr things the ones that uh, i was watching were like a bottle they, there's a bottle filled with sands or mar, sand or marble marbles so i think it's marbles and they would they would roll the glass bottle down a set of cement stairs so you hear Ooh. like the clink rolling like a glass bottle rolling sound then you hear the clink as it hits the stair and then by the second or third stair it cracks and then you hear marbles bouncing like in synchronicity like down the stairs and for some reason these view, these videos always have like 10 million 10 million views on them just because they're like oddly satisfying to watch and people just love that combination of, of the visual plus the sound. And so we took that and we remixed that with our product, basically. We, we, we've we integrated it in with our product so that the video starts with that rolling thing. And then we just sort of hijack the video and show our product upon the smash. And way more people watch that than if we just start with our product, even though it's a complete bait and switch. That's interesting. Yeah. I mean, if you go up to someone on the street and be like, hey, do you love physics? Do you want to study physics? They're like, no, but that's actually not the truth. Humans love physics. We all love physics. We're obsessed with physics. And it starts at A0. <laughs> so interesting. So yeah, so this this uh ad to prevent drunk driving did the you know, all these these same things and it worked. So, okay, so here's a a, a modern story. So, 2010 when we were were starting Golden Hippo, my brother comes to me and he says, hey, have you, you heard of probiotics? And, and I hadn't. And I was like, what are those? And he, he says, well, you know, you got all these bacteria in you. And I was like, okay, what do you mean? He's like, you know, your microbiome. I'm like, what's that? You know, and he goes on to tell me that, you know, you, you take these probiotics, which are good beneficial bacteria, it's supposed to do something, right? So I take them and I started having a lot more regular poops. I don't know who, what I was eating before, but they started working. And I was like, why? Why is this affecting me? I'm a pretty healthy guy. I'm in pretty good shape. Um, this is this is actually helping me out. And I started looking into it, and I realized that all of these foods I was eating that I thought were healthy because they said uh, low fat or whatever on them had sugars or artificial sweeteners or things like that pumped into them from the food companies, and they were uh, on the na on the labels under different names, so you don't know what they are, you know. Like sucralose or, um, right, you know, agave nectar, things like that. You know, like uh, you, you would right. think and it could say zero healthy. sugars on the label, yeah. but the zero ingredients would have these like, substitutes. Yeah, yeah, but it's got agave, it's got corn syrup, it's got like you know natural fruit juices. You know, all those things are, are sugars. And so, I started digging into this, and there was some shady stuff, man. There was some some experiments done where like like. You know, the sugar companies would would pay a farmer to, uh, uh, you know, li food is very expensive for livestock. And, and farmers always dream that they could give their livestock sugar instead of food. And they, they'd be able to use that as a nutrient so they could stop this big food expense. And like they do that and they try it and the cows would all die, you know. And then they tried it. Okay, well, let's take the food and let's add sugar and see what happens. And then the cows would still die, <laughs> you know, and then they would bury the studies, right? And then the the uh, artificial sweetener things were even worse. So there was a company, uh, G.D. Searle, that invented uh, artificial sweetener called aspartame. It's now known as NutraSweet. What a lot of people don't know is when they he came up with his artificial sweetener, they knew it'd be a, a billion dollar product um, because the sweetener market had already been built out. They started testing it on lab animals and the lab animals were growing tumors. And... The scientists got popped for the first time ever that um, the government filed criminal charges against a food company for falsifying studies because the scientists were cutting the tumors out of the animals and sewing them back up and saying, oh, no tumors here. And they got caught doing that. Wow. And so I found out about all this and I was just like completely mystified. And so I wrote this presentation about this and I talked about probiotics and how 
a way to combat the artificial sweeteners and, and sugars that are being pumped into your foods that it'd be impossible for you to uh, discover them all, you know, is to add good bacteria because those, um, you know, the, the bad bacteria growth that, that happens because of all this consumption that makes the bad bacteria get really frothy um, need to be offset by good bacteria. And so I put this video together and it went absolutely bananas. So uh, it was seen by probably, uh, you know, 100 million people. It's hard to track, uh, but um, the last we checked, there was over 100 million. And this is in a period of, of about four months. Joe Rogan tweeted it out and someone wrote, they're like, hey, Joe, do you realize this is a, uh, actually an advertisement for a probiotic? And he wrote back, oh, yeah, you know, I didn't see that till the end. I, I tweeted out before I, I got to the end of the video, but you should <laughs> watch it or something like that, you know? Um, and it, it created the biggest uh, probiotic brand in the world at the time. And it was because of this educational component, showing people that the, your food supply is messed up and you have something called a microbiome that's getting affected by your food supply. And one way to aid that is with, with probiotics. And so if you look at the Google trends, which we didn't have in the twenties, you know, I'm sure if we could do this for Google for the twenties and look at like, you know, uh, cigarettes, <laughs> right. You see like the big spike after the, the, uh, Easter day parade, right. Um, or VW bug, you'd see the big spike, uh, after the, uh, the think small campaign, but we have this now. So if you look at probiotics, you know, probiotics, were gaining some steam here and here's where, um, our ad comes online is, uh, key biotics was our brand. So look at the general spike in probiotics. Okay. So what, what happened there? Well, you can see basically the day we get kicked off of Google and it goes down and, uh, you see the trend line goes down too. Um, but then you see it, 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 it goes back up again. And, you know, this is what we launched our next probiotic brand, perfect biotics, uh, you know, did, did okay. It, it wasn't the, the huge banger of success that, that key biotics was, but fear not. Met a guy named Dr. Gundry in 2016. We launched a brand with him and look at, look at these spike lines, look at the probiotic spike lines compared with, with the term Gundry and the yeah, reason we were synchronized more Gundry in some days is when the, the campaigns would be running really strong, you know, read the the video is running, running a lot. That's where the, the searches would go crazy. And that was because Dr. Gundry is out there with, with our educational presentations, talking about the microbiome and talking about probiotics and prebiotics and really just educating the world on this stuff. And, you know, we didn't bring probiotics to America or, or anything like that. Uh, but I like to think we were probably a company that taught more people than anyone about the microbiome. And now, you know, the probiotic trends, uh, you know, keeps, keeps going. And I think it just keeps going, uh, up and to the right. If you, if you find the, the current data, you know, and, and by now the, uh, market has changed. You know, I, I talked about, uh, I did a Twitter thread a ways back where I talked about the three stages of a product market. So there's clueless, which is when you need to create uh, the, the the marketing wave because your your market knows nothing about the the product, right? So back then, when I started, no one knew anything about probiotics. So if I just said like, "Hey, here's probiotics, try them out," no one would have cared. But I started with something they did care about was was like, "Hey, is your digestion messed up? Are you having irregularity at the bathroom?" Well, here's the reason why. And then the next stage of the market is. Um, is curious where someone's probably heard the term probiotics and, and you can jump in. And so while my ads in 2013, 2014 were starting with digestive health, I had an ad in 2018, I believe it was. And the headline was doctor says, throw your probiotics in the trash. And enough people knew about probiotics by then. They were like, Oh, that's wait, wait, I heard these are good for you. You know, right. And then you click on it and then it goes on to talk about how oh, most probiotics don't have enough strains of potency and also, you know, prebiotics are important and, and this and that, you know. So that's just knowing the market where it was and, and, and where you need to jump in. And then the next level of the uh, market is, is saturation. And that's kind of where the probiotics market is now. I'm not launching new probiotics. Uh, you know, I, I, every time I go to a conference, someone comes up to me, they're like, hey, I'm launching a probiotic. I mean, 
good luck. She, you know, it's it's pretty right. commoditized by now. But there's still some that have, have broken through with with strong campaigns. Amazing. And so see, these are the seven hijacks. Uh, I'll read them out here. So number one, make it about them. So that's make it about the customer and the benefits that they're going to get. Number two, make it an event. That's the, um, you know, nothing attracts a crowd like a crowd. Um, then number three is a powerful demonstration. So that's the P.T. Barnum. That's the elevator uh, with the axe. That's the sword cutting through the bullet. Um, that's the drinking dirty water. Um Show unquestionable proof. So that's using experts like doctors or uh, influencers. Plus, um, you know, like you said, he was willing to be in the elevator while the thing was cut. You know, that's a, a demonstration of proof. Five, change a daily behavior. And I think this was change an existing daily behavior. Um, um, is that right? Or is it change any daily behavior? I mean, it, c- it could be either, you know? Okay. So, and so this is like bulletproof getting you to add something into your coffee, something you're already doing or like breakfast, uh, having a hearty breakfast as the start of your day versus, uh, you know, just a coffee in, in, a, in a bread roll. Yeah, um, so he hijacked, Dave hijacked to the daily behavior. And right. what we did with probiotics is we changed the daily behavior. We uh, encouraged them to take something every day. So then six is sell the dream. That's the the movie star smile that's underneath that film. If only you would start brushing your teeth or this is, uh, Craig pooping regularly because he now takes uh, you know probiotics, prebiotics. That's the dream. And then number seven is help them um, uh, be a rebel or feel superior. And so that's you know be able to to stick a middle finger to the man, whoever the man is, whether it's Nike or it's uh, you know women not having equal rights or whatever. Um, give them the tools and the badge to to feel like they're superior and uh, in a rebellion, a part of a rebellion. That's right. Amazing. Well said. Well said. You're you're a I'm a good student. student. Yeah. <laughs> well, this is I mean, the stuff that's in here is um I guess like this is rare in two ways. Number one, I took marketing classes in college. And I had marketing professors. None of my marketing professors had ever done what you did. They never created a category. They never did a billion dollars in sales. They never sat there and crafted um, you know, even this presentation when we talked 3 days ago, it was going to be like Marketing throughout the decades. No, and you were like, no, that's not going to be the t- title. I got to think of something good. And you come back with seven, seven human hijacks, how marketers have hijacked your brain. And I'm like, oh God, just seeing you go from two days ago with no title or a shitty working title to like a really strong title is seeing somebody in action or hearing you, you what you did with the, the uh, probiotics market. So number one, the opportunity to have a teacher who's actually a master of the game is so rare. So obviously I'm sitting up in my seat. I'm paying attention. Number two, any one of these, like I'm thinking as you were talking, my brain was like having almost a hard time listening because I'm firing ideas for any of my companies on like, oh, a powerful demonstration. How could we show this in a way that's exaggerated and would 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 almost be kind of shocking or add some drama to what we're doing versus just saying the feature or saying it's good? Like, you know, how could we like do do a powerful demonstration that would give people unquestionable proof, right? So I couldn't even like, stop my brain from moving while I'm doing this. Now that's, the, I don't know, that's the entrepreneur in me, but I think there's a lot of people who are listening that are like that, that like, if you paid attention to this, even one of these hijacks could like literally like change the trajectory of your company. So anyways, I appreciate you putting this together. This is kind of a, this is amazing to me. Um, I don't know how other people are going to feel about this, but like as, a, as the only student in the room right now, I was, uh, you know, I, I'm pumped about this. This is, this is great. Well, I, I appreciate the kind words and, you know, if they, as they say, if you could change the life of just one person, right, then your job right. is complete. So I'll take it. All right. Well, you did it. <laughs> this has been a masterclass uh, for sure. So thanks for, thanks everyone for watching. That's the pod. 